Part of being a liturgical church is that there are forms and structures that are provided. And so this prayer day, I would think it would be very intimidating to say, I'm going to go pray over the property. I'd be thinking, what do I pray after the first five minutes? You know, dear Jesus, bless the property. I mean, what, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I didn't know what all these prayer people do all night. Well, part of what is is that in reading the Psalms, we're prayerfully reading those Psalms out loud. It's a way of prayer. And they're in that packet that Carmen and Jackie and maybe some others help with, uh, there's enough there to get you a good 40, 50 minutes uh, just in praying those Psalms of God's victory over the property. And we're really just asking God to set this property aside. I want to remind you that in the early church, probably the most powerful missionary movement was the Celts. And the Celts, uh, which, you know, I didn't know anything about them really. Uh, I was a Lakers fan. Anyway, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the Celts, what they would do is they would go into a place and they would go to the most defiled place. Typically, there have been murders. That's where people would practice the occult, sacrifice uh, animals, people. They would go to the darkest place in the area where God sent them. And they would claim that place. And nobody wanted it because it had a history of, of bad things. That's why uh, it was. And so the Celts would fast and pray between 40 and 60 days. And they would deal with the demonic and having spent that time, God's presence, and it's like when they preached the gospel, when they prayed for the sick, everything changed because they had first spent that time reclaiming them, praying over, asking God's blessing for him to remove the bad and to fill uh, that land and that place with his presence and the success uh, that they had between like 350 and 600. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you that as a young priest in 2001, when we opened this, I never even heard of something like that. I knew how to bless the exercise the property uh, as a, you know, half an hour thing that you bless the property. But I did not know what it meant to sort of cleanse the land and to ask God in a much more intentional way to bring his blessing. Uh, but I tell you this, the Lord hears us uh, and it matters. And we want to see a whole lot of people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, and a whole lot of people to be built up in the faith and so we're spending this time partly going, you know, we're praying for the whole property, not just the Blake property, partly because, uh, although there's been a lot of fasting over this property in prayer now, but, but in a sense, just thanking God for this and asking him. You know, first assembly, now the greenhouse, on that property where they used to be, and I'm sure it's going to happen the new property, there is an anointing on that property and that church for bringing people to Christ and has been uh, since Pastor last year, I, you know, I don't know, why does God give a church a destiny like that? It's like the Lord anointed Pastor Lassinger and certainly Pastor Mike as well. But, but, I mean, that church has had a destiny in the city of bringing people to know Jesus Christ. And, and a whole lot, I don't know that they would have done it the way we're doing it, but, but they would be doing the same thing. And that is they fasted and prayed uh, through the years, if not at the beginning, over that property in the most intentional way. They gave that land to God. Whoever, if it's this Vita Springs or whoever gets that property, there's something on the land. You know, remember about Odeb Edom last week, and, and there's something on the land, even to this day, uh, where the ark rested there with Obed Edom. Uh, and it's literally known. The Muslims talk about it. The Jews talk about it. The Christians talk about it. And um, I was talking to someone in this church who actually has been there after service told me. I can't remember who it was. But anyway... Uh, no one's raising their hand. But anyway, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. When we ask God, he means business. Remember, in the Bible, when the, talk, the concept of blessing is discussed, it is always connected with the land. There's always a physical manifestation. The, the inward reality of knowing Jesus and God's blessing always reflects. It's not, uh, you know, it's not just about cars and lands or something, but, but it's not less than... Uh, blessing that manifests in the material world, but of course the, the greater and the bigger is what he does on the inside of us, but, but because of his presence here, all kinds of other blessings uh, are expected to come, and, and we're going to ask him, uh, and he's going to be really faithful. He, he always, uh, you know, the, one of the prayers that we say, I don't know which week it is, but it says, O Lord who is always more willing to hear than we are to ask. He is waiting for us to ask in Jesus' name. Uh, and uh, so it's going to be an exciting time. It starts this Tuesday. Uh, now, again, uh, very few of us, if any of us, are going to fast for 40 days. Uh, but we can take a day or two, all right? On Tuesday, I'm getting a little 
basil cell off my nose. I can't remember which side now. But anyway, one of the sides I'm going in and getting a little cut. So I won't be here on Tuesday, but we will, I'll be here a lot of those days as well, of, of course, praying and fasting over the property. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? There's a Bible in front of you. They might put it on the screen if you're nice. And some of you have it on an iPad or a phone as well. You know, it's so funny how the world has changed. I'm 53. In my first 40 years, if you had told me that I would encounter Hindus and Muslims regularly and get to know them and like them, to me, I knew that they were out there, but I had no idea in a, you know, that I would meet them, that I would become you know, sort of neighbors and friends, and, and I'd learn about them and, and, and really fall in love with them and realize how much Jesus loves them. To go to India... And to see, you know, because it always seems so other and so distant, you know. What about the Muslims? And it, it, it seems like, what, you know, in a land far, far away. But once uh, we've gone other countries, then we, of course we see him here. And we, we realize Jesus loves these people in a most profound way. And I'm so inspired by what the Holy Spirit is doing all over the world in bringing Hindus and Muslims to Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and, and it's really important that we have a very deep sense, a profound sense one of the things that my friend Todd, you know, I, he used to pray when I'd visit. I mean, I think he prays this all the time. But he asked that the Lord would allow his church, that as a church, that they would love the world that Jesus died for. And, and in increasing numbers, that means that we need to love the Hindus and the Muslims and, 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 uh, and the lost at all kinds of levels. And um, so in this text this morning, Paul's letting it, it's, it was very close and personal to Paul to have foreign gods and temples right there where he was living. Of course, the dominant religions, the Greek and the Romans, uh, you could not basically experience daily life in the Greek and Roman world without going to the temple. Often that would be the place where the water was. If you wanted to get the water and not get sick, you'd have to go there. If you had to pay your taxes, if you had to do any kind of business, everything. Was, the, the temples were not only dedicated to the religious or cultic aspects of life, Almost all the social life of the Roman and Greek world was organized around the temple. And that's just how it was. And so people had to. The great concern of the early church and the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15 was to not eat uh, raw meat, because uh, a rare uh, meat that had not been cooked. Because in the feast, they would go in there and they would rip apart live animals. And in these frenzy uh, things, they would eat animals that had never been cooked at all. Uh, it, it was some sick stuff. And... And uh, my kids make fun of me because they say I always mention orgies. It's in this text today. The Greek and Roman world, in their temples, they had priests and priestesses. And they were prostitutes. I mean, they were temple prostitutes. And they understood that people would come, they would give offerings, they would eat feasts, and then they would have bisexual sex, homosexual, heterosexual sex. That's what they did. This is, that was a daily occurrence. That was as much of a normal part of Greek and Roman life is anything. All right? It was a very corrupt world. And, and, and so, in this very corrupt place, Corinth, that was known to be one of the worst places, it was sort of the Las Vegas, Hong Kong, New York, whatever the, the most wild cities you can think of combined, that was Corinth. You know, we've been there. Some of you have been there. It's amazing to see. It's not really a real big place. You go there today, and you think, it's just hard to imagine. This, you know, I wonder what it would have looked like when that temple was there. Uh, two temples, but one particularly Diana, I believe, is the big one. So, in any case, the Corinthians were, of course, not Jewish. They were primarily a church that was Gentile. In Greek, it's the word is ethnos for, for pagans or Gentiles. It just means not Jewish. You know, everybody who's not Jewish was the Gentiles or the, or the, the nations, or some translation will say, are the pagans. But they were people who worshipped other gods. Primarily, in the ancient world, they were animists, meaning that they worship idols and deities Demons connected, or gods that they say, we call them demons, connected to their idols. Now, we don't give some of these people credit. A lot of them understood, if not all of them, that their idol, the physical object, was bigger and more. That there were demons, or spiritual power, connected. They weren't just, uh, they weren't slow. I mean, they went there when their kids were dying. They sacrificed chickens. They went to the, to the person. They did human sacrifice. They did all kind of stuff. They knew that in some way, uh, in relationship to their temple, there was power. And there was power, but it was coming from the devil. 
And of course, it was not a power that ultimately helped people, but it enslaved them more and more. So the Corinthian church was very wise. They were well-educated, not unlike a place like Gainesville. And, and, and they were big-hearted people, and they were big-minded people. And, and, and so they felt like, hey, uh, we, got, we know Jesus. Uh, we've been baptized. We've been spirit-filled. We, we take communion. We can go back to the temple, and we can hang out and eat, eat the feast there. We can go back and participate and not be defiled by the demons. We're, we're more mature than that. We, we're deeper than that. And, and so you're sort of an antiquated Jewish ideas of real hard lines of separation between us and the culture. That's not, that's not the way it is. We know better. And so Paul writes 1 Corinthians 10 as a response to a laxity of participation of the believer into the cultic systems of the day. Now, I say before 40, I would... Can you imagine, I've been to India, and I've, been at, I've seen the Hindu temples. I, I've been to the mosques. I've, I mean, not in to pray, mind you, but I mean, I've been there. I, you, you can't go to Chad where we go. I'm supposed to be in Chad, I think, uh, this January. Everywhere we go, at 4 o'clock in the morning, or whatever, or 3.30, whatever it is, you'll hear them. They wake you up. They're in their mosque praying. I mean, every, everywhere you go, there's little mosques and places, and it's, it's wild. I mean, because you... First can attend, it used to be a storybook like this, land far away, long time ago, it's coming upon us. I believe God is bringing the world to us, by the way. I'm not afraid that the Hindus and Muslims are coming. I believe they're coming for a purpose. But I believe God wants to purify his church uh, so that we can be a light. All right, so, so Paul's here talking about these very smart Gentile believers who think it's okay to mix things that cannot be mixed. All right? And this is really, really important. And, and I have talked to people in Gainesville who go and participate in the mosque, and, attend, and, and they're trying to do it as a missionary, but they have not considered the biblical principles. All right? So let me give you some biblical lines, not from my uh, thoughts, but from Paul's this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now you know the context. He is, they wrote a letter, and they asked Paul's opinion, only to really discount it. Have you ever had people say, what do you think, but they're already going to not pay attention? Yeah, okay. Well, kind of how it was with Paul. Here we go. But he says, Moreover, brothers, I don't want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, and the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ, but with most of them God was not pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. What's that all about? Okay, he's saying, look, you guys think you're so smart because you've been, you prayed in tongues and, and you've been, uh, you, know, you were baptized and you take communion every Sunday. You think you're so smart. Listen, he say God interacted with your fathers, the Jews, in very profound ways and he still punished them for idolatry and mixing things that weren't supposed to be mixed. Now, what's amazing is, as he writes to these pagans, now believers, but from this, he calls the Jews, or the fathers, from the Old Testament, the Israelites, he says, in essence, that's your family. That's, this is shocking that he would call that church as believers who have no connection ethnically to, to Jews to say, they're your fathers. You know that we've been grafted in. In some forms of Calvinism and other things, they have what's called replacement theology. And they think that the church has replaced Israel. First, Romans 11 does not say we replace them. It says the wild branches. We're the wild branches. We've been grafted into something. Okay? But the, the something is still there, meaning God's promise and, 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 and covenant with Israel. Even if individual Jews in you know, many generations have not followed him, there's a day coming, the Bible promises, where they're going to turn back their hearts to him. We've been grafted in so that we can look at the Old Testament and that can become a model and a pattern for us and we can learn from it. Uh, because that's now our heritage once we were grafted in to Jesus because that's who he comes from. The Old Testament uh, is written for our learning, and that's our spiritual uh, heritage as well. Very surprising. So he says, look, they had a pillar of, of cloud and a pillar of fire. They, they went through the Red Sea together. Can you imagine? They were baptized into Moses. We were baptized into Christ. But they, they had this incredible experience where God, where the east wind came and blew open the sea, and they walked through on dry ground. He's saying they had spiritual experiences. Because see, the Corinthians were like, well, we know how to prophesy, and, and we've got gifts of healing, and, and we know how to speak in tongues, and, and they were the spiritual elite. And they thought it was okay because of their gifts 
to compromise their character. Listen, gifts are not character or maturity. I was telling them at 8 o'clock, today, someone could get saved today and have the greatest gift of evangelism that ever lived. Gifts come by the Spirit, in your salvation, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. Does not guarantee that you've got maturity, meaning you, I could get up and pray on Sunday morning and be doing evil all week. A gift doesn't guarantee that. You, we, want, we want people with gifts, yes. But we want people with holiness, with character, who are following Jesus. And it is possible to have profound gifts, but not to be, have a character that's formed in Christ's likeness. And what Paul's saying to these people in Corinth is, which apparently they had great gifts. We would probably be jealous of all the gifts, particularly of prophecy. Apparently, you could come into church and if you were visiting, we have a few visitors, but imagine if you came in and this morning God started telling me your secrets. And I started saying, oh, this, 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 and that. I've been in churches where the person had a gift like that. Pretty amazing. And he says, hey, 1 Corinthians 14. He says that the people would know God and get saved. Uh, the gifts have their purpose, but, but the Corinthians saw their experiences as if it was a resume that they could then go out and venture out and to pollute themselves in some things, and yet God is a jealous God, and God says it's not okay. So Paul rehearses for them profound experiences that the Israelites had with God. And he says they correspond to the ones that the Corinthians. We might think, well, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I'm okay. I can do this. And yet the Bible is saying, no, no, you can't. Paul's saying, no, you can't. Not without experiencing God's chastisement and discipline. Paul goes on to say, some people, because of these things that we're going to discuss in a minute, some people have gotten sick and died younger than they were supposed to because God took them out. Because they did not discern the reality and the holiness of what it means that we're the body of Christ in communion. And therefore they were judged because of these kind of behaviors. And this is what Paul's saying. He said, don't you know, for 40 years people were strewn, strewn, laid all out in the desert, dead. Because they rebelled against God and they didn't take his love and his, his covenant seriously. All right? Kind of heavy day, but you're visiting as you're, you know, what can I do? All right, here we go. So now look at verse 6. Now these examples from the Old Testament, there, there are models, there are templates to the intent that we should not desire lust after evil things as they also lust it. Now, the word for lust is a word, it's, it's the same word for desire, meaning it's, it can be appropriate desire, Okay, if you're married, I can say, I got desire for my wife. That's fine. That's, so the word would be desire or love in some context. It's lust when it is a desire for something that God does not allow. The theological expression would be an inordinate desire. And a desire outside of God's commandment. All right? So, you know, if I, if I desire the six-ounce steak, when I desire the 32-ounce prime rib, whatever, you know what I mean? There's a difference of desire. All right? Healthy and unhealthy. We should not crave after lust, after evil things, as they lust it. Why not? Because God's judgment is sure. His love is profound and lavish, but he's not playing games either. We have churches that emphasize the holiness of God and the reverence of God without the warmth and the love of Jesus. And so they're dead and they're, it's all reverence and all that, but, but there's no intimacy. And there's other churches that emphasize Jesus as your friend, and they forget Jesus is Lord. And we've got to hold these two things together. It's not easy, but we've got to do it. Now these things became our examples, verse 6, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lust it. 7, and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Meaning, he's saying, look, Corinthians, you're going into these places, you're going into the temple, sure you've got to pay your taxes and some, but you can't go feast in the temple. You can't eat the Ramadan feast. You can't participate in Diwali. You've got Hindu neighbors and Muslims. Listen, we love them. They don't participate in communion because they respect what? They respect their own gods and our religion. And yet you've got Christians saying it's no big deal. It's a real big deal. Because, and we're going to look at this next week because Paul's going to explain more clearly why. But he's saying, look, it's one thing. We can have, I can eat dinner with a Hindu or Muslim. No problem. But if it's a feast, meaning a feast that's connected to the religious worship, to do that is to participate with the demons and to take Jesus and me and participate with the demons that they're worshiping, their gods, in the feast. That is not okay. We can have Muslim friends, Hindu friends. I have, at this point, many. I'm shocked to tell you. Who would have guessed? 
a hillbilly who would guess I'd be up having all kinds of friends. And, and, and where Jesus would show me how much he loves them. I would have, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, what's a text like this worth for? I would never see this. Hey, we're seeing it all over the place now. And particularly in the younger generations, where some of the older generations look at the, these people like our enemy instead of a, a white with harvest mission field, the younger generation think, oh, we can go and do all this and, and, and sort of uh, uh, love them, and, and, but, but really loving them in a way in which we're sacrificing holiness in terms of those things which are separate. If it is a religious feast, you cannot eat a meal with people from other religions. That includes, now, Ramadan, I don't know if you know, that the idea of fasting all daylight hours and breaking the feast every night in Ramadan, that was an early Christian practice. Islam, or Muhammad, took that directly. That was one of the ways the early Christians fasted. That's a fit Christian practice. But when it's Ramadan, we cannot participate in it. Okay? Because there's more going on. It's not just food. It's not just food. It's worship. And we can't be there for the worship of things other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit revealed in Jesus Christ. The people sat down to eat and drink, he says. They participated in the feast. Then what happened? Again, my kids make fun of me because I say orgies, but they got up to play, which means they got up and they had sex and these orgies with the people. He's saying the Corinthians claimed that they were just sort of being good neighbors, whatever. But what happened was, as they were doing this with the feast, they also were going back and participating in an unholy lifestyle. And that the demons connected, remember in the Bible, idolatry is always connected to fornication and adultery. Did you know that? So that in the Old Testament, they can use, they can talk about, they can talk about adultery, but they're really talking about idolatry. In times they're talking about adultery, and they're talking then about uh, adultery. Because they're so connected. That part of what happens when we open ourselves up to evil spirits is our, we're no longer by the Holy Spirit to keep ourselves in check, and instead we're operating out of our worst intentions, magnified by the presence of demons, and then we're doing things that don't please God, that are evil, and things that Jesus died to cleanse us from. All right? Eight, nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. In one day, 23,000 people died. Is that key you pause? Why? Because God is holy, and because the Jews had to be set apart to give us the Messiah that would save the world and save all the peoples. And the Jews had to be protected and disciplined in direct order to keep careful boundaries so that they could stay pure in a sense that they could give us the Messiah according to God's purpose and plan. But that's a really, really big discipline. Hard to even imagine a God whose holiness is like that. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpent. Some of you know the story, you know, numbers, of the, and then the pole, they had to look at the pole because of their murmuring and rebellion uh, and their adultery, and so God struck them with snakes. That would be a bad one for me. I saw a black snake this week on my walkway, and I had a heart attack. Ten, nor complain. The word is to murmur. It's to speak against God. After all the manner, the people said, uh, oh, you know, God, you never take care of it. We, we, we long for meat. So remember, he sent the quail. But thousands of them died choking. I think 17,000 died choking on the quail. They had given themselves over so much into their earthly appetites that they complained against God. They spoke against his character. They blasphemed against his character. And when the quail came, this is where you get the expression, be careful what you ask for. So many people out there asking for it's all blessings and fancy cars. And stuff. Sometimes God answers your prayer, but he judges you with the answer. There's a whole lot of people being destroyed because they're trying to use God as an ATM. Sometimes God answers the prayer. But when you ask with an adulterous heart, it will end up not going well for you. That's the principle, the whole story of the quail in the wilderness. Nor complain as some complained and were destroyed by their, the destroyer. Eleven. Now these things happen to them so we could learn as examples for us. It, God is a jealous God. He loves us. He has died. He, he has committed himself in the fullest possible way. He joined himself to our condition in his baptism. And then he died on the cross to rescue us and to bring us into relationship. 
with his life. These things happen to them as examples and are written for our admonition, our warning, so we don't make mistakes and have our lives be destroyed as well. Upon whom the ends of the world is going to be Paul's saying the old age and the new age are coming and they're clashing and, and there's this big thing getting ready to happen until the return of Christ. And he says, it's coming together and, and, and this judgment is going to come in a final way soon. And we're those people. If they were those people, we're surely those people as well. Twelve. Let him, therefore, who thinks he's above this and he can stay clean, not, he can play with this and don't have to be careful. He said, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's a lot of pride in us. Certainly a lot of pride in me. I don't know you. I never see it until it's too late. And then I realize I have a lot of repenting. Now, this is the focus. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common demand. The first thing the devil gets you with to give in to temptation and to lesser your character and your morals is to suggest to you self-pity. That you're in a situation, you just don't know how much I love her. You don't know. I know I'm married, but I haven't been happy. Self-pity, the first thing. He says, no temptation has come upon you, but which everyone else goes through. And we have to make the decision. Part of faith the definition of faith is loyalty. Faith is an expression of our loyalty to God. That's not the only thing it is. But it's part of understanding what the... It is to make choices in agreement and loyalty to the God who loves us and died for us. And that controls then our moral choices. No temptation's overtaken you except what everyone else is going through. Don't believe the lie that you're alone and it's harder for you and if anyone knew your story, it'd be so... No. Uh, Paul said it's, that's not the way it is. These temptations are common to us. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear. it. Now, part of what he's saying to these people here is the way of escape of temptation of the immorality and idolatry is not to be gone into the temple. Flee! Flee! Now, it's on tape, so I've got to be careful. When I was a little boy, my grandmother, my mother's mother, used to sit me on her knee. And she, I've told some of you this before. And she would read me the Proverbs. Now, I, don't, I look back and think, I don't think she did this to the other two, my two older sisters and younger brothers. So did she think I needed more wisdom than someone else? I don't know. Maybe she thought I was remedial. But, but she would sit there, and I can remember her sitting and reading me the Proverbs. And then she would explain things that I couldn't understand because one of the problems that stuck with me that my grandmother taught me is don't even go down the street of the prostitute. Now, I didn't know what prostitution was, and she didn't tell me. But she did explain to me this, that there are temptations that it's too late once you get near them. That the way you take the way of temptation, you avoid it is, you don't go down the street. You don't put yourself in harm's way. Once you put yourself and make all these other little choices, yeah, maybe there you couldn't find the way of escape because the way of escape was you knew not to do this, 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 this before you got to there. So the way of escape for Paul is flee. Flee. Because otherwise, you will open yourself up to these demons and it will twist your mind and what is evil will look good and what is good looks evil. But to those who will hold on, God will also provide a way of escape. But sometimes it means that the people around you will not respect you and will not, you'll lose some friends. I was in India some years ago and Susan and I were there. We were on a healing mission and some really wonderful people. But as it comes to find out, uh, this particular Anglican church, the bishop is in communion with Anglican. Apparently, all the Orthodox, everything's fine. The people that we were with, there were some Methodists, but they were pretty good people. Uh, we, we're doing great. But wouldn't you know it, there was an Episcopal priest from Michigan, and this woman did not believe Jesus was the only way. She didn't believe Jesus down the cross for her sins. She was based, I don't know how she became any kind of quasi-Christian. I don't get it. But come to find out on the Sunday morning after ministering there, and we're kind of the favorite guest. I mean, we're, we're with a small group of guests from America. This American woman is leading the service. The service she read, it was fine. But she herself is a heretic. And she herself 
Her feet, in bare feet, she's there, and her feet are stained with the geraniums because she had literally been worshiping at the Hindu temple the night before. And I'm not kidding. Now what do we do? We're in a cathedral with all these important people. We're the guests. But because a feast is not only about the food, there are spirits there, we could not participate in the communion because it was led by a person who we knew did not believe Jesus was the only way. And a person who clearly opened herself up particularly and deliberately even to idols and the demons connected. But do you know that basically the people we went with, who are all good people, we embarrassed them. Now we didn't get them to say, she's a heretic. I could have. It would have been true. Susan and I didn't make a scene. We just simply could not participate. And no matter how quiet we were, we made the people we were so uncomfortable that basically we never heard of them since. It was a re- and they're good Christians. They felt like being a nice person was a bigger value. Now they're all older than me, and you know they can live their choice. I'm not trying to judge them, but I'm saying to me it was clear I cannot do that. They felt like to embarrass the people would be worse and go ahead and take communion. My hunch is they don't think communion is what I think is communion. My hunch is that's part of fundamentally, I actually believe God's showing up in a powerful way by the Spirit, manifesting the body and blood of Jesus. And I think because of that, it's more clear to me. But in any case, the way of escape sometimes is we have to stand for Jesus even when it hurts. Even when we're misunderstood. Even when we can't explain ourselves. Because the necessity for holiness, and I'm not talking religiosity, Okay? I hope God sends me more Muslim and Hindu neighbors and stuff. I'm, I'm, praise the Lord. I just can't worship and eat during religious festivals and open myself up to demons and betray the God who loved me and died for me, and neither can you. It seems like far, far away, but it's coming to us more and more. But I really believe the ends of earth are coming to us that we can love these people and be a holy and shining light and to share the love of Jesus with them. Not religiosity, not phoniness. You know, you can carry your Bible on your phone. You don't have to carry a big Bible. But you do have to live for Jesus. Okay, we've got to live for Jesus. and We've got to be clear. There's got to be boundary markers. Eat dinner with them? Yes. Just not dinner when it's connected to a feast. During the week of Diwali, it's a feast to the idols. You may not know that. But during Diwali, that's when they invite you over. It's like having Thanksgiving and Christmas for a week. And they want you to come, and they prepare a great feast, and they want you to be there. But you can't in that time. The week before, the week after, sure. Have them at your house, but not then. So Pastor Godin was going to be here in a couple of weeks. He told me, because we were talking theologically about this very principle, and I said, this must be very hard for you. He said, yeah, because our moms want us to come. Imagine if your mom said, come to Christmas dinner, and you don't go. Because it's connected with Hindu. They can't do it. The believers can't do it. So, yeah, I said, yeah, they get really mad at us. He said, we had to stop celebrating Christmas, not because they think it's German tree or something, all that nonsense, but because if they celebrate Christmas and gave people Christmas cookies and things, then they would get mad if they didn't come to Diwali. Okay, so they had to, they had to change the way they even worship, things that they were free to worship, but they had to downplay that because that would be used against them and, and break the trust of their testimony. If, if the world's getting more complicated, but that's how it was in Corinth. And God wants to there is judgment. It really matters how we live our life. And we've got to be careful, not religious, but careful, that we're operating in such a way that reflects the loyalty and favor of Jesus to us, that we reflect that back to him. That's our bounden duty and service. It's not any extra credit. That's just what it means to, to love and to serve the God who died for us. It's just one-on-one. Uh, and we've got to hold on to these things carefully. At the same time, we need to love the world that Jesus died for. Okay? Have them for dinner. Come, you know, praise the Lord for all that. But the religious part, really clear. Next week, I'm going to look at the second half of 1 Corinthians 10. Paul then explains communion, the Jewish feast, and the Gentile feast, and the nature of what's going on, but it's not just food. That's, you know, if I had a big sermon title for next week, to tempt you to come back, it's not just food. That's next week. Now, I want to pray for you. I want to pray in this church uh, that the Lord 
would both purify us, even as he would give us an absolute passion. He loved the world so much, and the Hindus and the Muslims and so many others, he died for them. I, I want our church to be so full of holiness and love. And that can only happen as we turn to him and, and, and recognize that's not where we are, but by the power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, it can come to us if we ask him. If we confess what we're not, he will give us his life and he'll change us. All right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there's so many things, Lord. Lord, would you help us to stay clean and undefiled? It's a, it's a messed up world. And, and, and Lord, uh, even this morning, uh, reminded me about some of these things on Netflix and other things, Lord, that are so easy to enter in and the need to be careful with my heart. Lord, we pray. We want to love the people around us desperately and we want to, we want to share your love and, and be friends and, and, and absolutely. But Lord, keep us careful and keep us wise about what times a feast is different and would open us up to things that are evil and would betray you. Lord, help us to flee from things and not try to get so close. To flee from things that are evil. Give us discernment, discernment of spirits. Give us wisdom together. And then, Lord, let us be willing to quietly and humbly follow you the way we are led to, even when it's unpopular and even when other people uh, misunderstand us. Give us great humility that we wouldn't be self-righteous and something like that, but, but give us great humility to take our stand. Lord, as we trying as best we know how to honor you. Now, Lord, as we turn to continue this worship and to experience your presence together uh, and a special presence uh, by the Spirit of your body and blood, would you really bless us today? Would you really impress upon us how much your cross has set us free? And how much life is there for the, the taking as we ask you in faith and receive it. So bless us and strengthen us. I thank you for this family here that I love. Lord, I'm so glad we get to do life together here. Now bless us in Jesus' precious and holy name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.